Okay, if we can um, call the meeting to order, and can I welcome everyone to this, the 12th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2018. Okay. We have apologies from Brian Whittle. Maurice Corey is attending as committee substitute. The first item on our agenda today is the consideration of new petitions. The first petition for consideration is Petition 1692 on inquiry into the human rights impact of GIRFEC policy and data processing. This petition was lodged by Leslie Scott and Alison Preuss on behalf of Times Trust and Scottish Home Education Forum. The committee will take evidence from the petitioners this morning. And can I also welcome Liz Smith, MSP, who is in the gallery to hear this evidence. As members will be aware, I am the Deputy Convener of the Education and Skills Committee, and that committee is currently involved in the scrutiny of the Children and Young People Information Sharing Scotland Bill. It is the role of the Convener to facilitate debate, so in considering the petition this morning, I shall chair this item, but I shall leave it to my colleagues to ask questions. Can I welcome Leslie Scott and Alison Preuss to the meeting? Um, you have the opportunity to make an opening statement of up to five minutes, after which we will move to questions from the committee. Thank you. Um, we'd like to split the five minutes between us, if we may. Uh, so good morning. First, thank you to the committee for inviting us here. The Young ME Sufferers or Times Trust is the only national <laughs> ME charity dedicated to children and young people with a neurological disease, ME, and their families. In recent years, Times Trust has seen an escalation in calls to our advice line over families being referred and situations escalated to child protection services. Of the over 200 families facing such a situation who have contacted us, not one has been found to be at fault on further investigation. Yet these interventions can cause catastrophic trauma to those families involved, whether they be families with ME or not. Some families never recover from the overbearing and traumatic experience and become terrified of approaching services for help, something that the evidence submitted to the postcard from the Fringe event last year confirms. What this petition is asking for is an independent public inquiry into historic and current practice under the GERFEC approach. As a SPICE briefing put it, this petition relates to the current legal situation rather than the prospective, legal, uh, prospective legislation from the 2014 Act and 2017 Bill. The, 26 ruling from the 2016 ruling from the UK Supreme Court found that aspects of the 2014 Act were unlawful and breached Article 8 of the Human Rights Act. As a result, Parts 4 and 5 of the Act were unable to be implemented, yet the Scottish Government continues to encourage local authorities, health boards and other organisations to prepare for implementation of the Act by continuing to implement Getting It Right for Every Child. But Parts 4 and 5 of the 2014 Act are the Getting It Right for Every Child approach. It is as if the UK Supreme Court ruling had never happened. Wellbeing is a concept that lies at the heart of GERFIC. Despite the Supreme Court ruling that wellbeing is undefined and that the Shinari indicators are themselves undefined and in some cases notably vague, wellbeing remains in far too many cases the threshold at which practitioners are gathering and sharing information on families. And when families object or question such an approach, they are often escalated to child protection procedures on such spurious bases as non-engagement. The UK Supreme Court judgment records that personal autonomy is an important principle underlying the guarantees of the ECHR, that the family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society is an entitled to protection by society and the state. GERFREC in practice is the antithesis of these principles, and a full public inquiry is needed to reveal and correct the ongoing assault on family life. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to reiterate Leslie's thanks for the opportunity to come before the committee. Um, it's hard to, to condense what has become our life's work into a few minutes, to be honest. The home educators have been at the sharp end of this uh, shenari stick right from the outset. And we have evidence of multi-agency professionals getting it wrong and actually acting out with the law. Home education may well be a minority activity, but when the, when the rights of minorities are trampled on, the rights of everyone is, and that's a basic uh, founding principle of human rights law. Home, education, um, home educators have conducted a survey recently which found that the major drivers for it were unmet additional support needs, including chronic illness and disability, safety issues in schools, and the GERFEC cult, which has also seen parents abandoning nurseries and other care settings due to excessive data gathering, uh, which amounts to profiling. For example, background checks on home educating parents have absolutely no legal basis yet have found their way into local policies, so that entire families have had their health, police and social work records accessed without their knowledge, which is contrary to national guidance, the GDPR and convention rights. I wrote to the Education Directory 
Directorate sorry, in mid-May to raise serious concerns about this, but have had no reply whatsoever. Being ignored by public bodies is quite commonplace, we've found, and even lawyers' letters are now going unanswered. You might say that's non-engaging professionals. The problem is they're all working to practices and policies that have remained uncorrected since the Supreme Court judgment. And that includes the 2014 Child Protection Guidance, which actually shifted the threshold for data processing without consent. It was actually a series of backroom deals, which we found from the minutes, that caused the threshold to be dropped to a subjective notion of well-being from significant harm in 2013. That was a year before the, Act, the, the Children and Young People Act was passed and three years before the data processing provisions came into force. They never did, of course. The public were deliberately kept in the dark and it might have, because it might have an adverse effect. That was also in the minutes. We sounded the alarm at the time, but were completely ignored and excluded from all the debate. Basically, the government needs to get its story straight. Either GERFIC data collection and sharing is consent-based below the risk of significant harm, or it isn't. Now, if it is, that's absolutely fine, and the higher GDPR threshold will then apply. If it isn't, we have actually been misled, and there still needs to be a legal basis that satisfies Article 8.2 of the European Convention. Well-being doesn't cut it, as the Supreme Court has said. Now, human rights are self-defined, whereas shenari well-being outcomes are state-dictated, as parents have found. They're open to dangerously subjective interpretation. Families have also been denied remedy for wrongdoing, having been told it was all legal when it actually wasn't. Even if they had a spare £15,000 for judicial review, legal time bars may well have kicked in. Meanwhile, inaccurate information is still being peddled by public and third sector bodies, which actually adds insult to injury. I should stress that our evidence is comprehensive. It comes from public records, freedom of information responses, families subject access requests, correspondence and recordings. We do need an independent inquiry into this debacle. There's also need, a real need for victims to relate their own experiences privately to MSPs rather than be paraded in the national press before another, another assault on human rights is voted through. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And then we move on to um, some questions. Um, Rona Mackay. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Leslie. Good morning, Alison. Um, in your petition, you refer to uh, numerous public meetings which have been held since 2013. Can you give us some detail of these meetings? Um, who was present? Who arranged them? And were there Scottish Government representatives present? Um, the, the No to NP campaign, which we are heavily involved in, organised the meetings as an awareness-raising exercise for, for the public uh, in, into what was actually happening on the ground. Leslie and I have both spoken at these meetings. There were, I couldn't actually tell you offhand how many there were, but there were several and they were all over Scotland and they were very well attended. And were there any Scottish Government representatives no, present? No. no. They were welcome to attend, but, but they didn't come. Were they invited? Well, um, there were open meetings. Yeah, there were just open meetings for anybody who wanted to go. Um, I believe uh, John Mason came to one that we were in in Cathcart. Mm. Yeah, so, you know, anybody, if, if they wanted to go, they could have gone. How many meetings were there? Roughly? Oh, there was, oh, there must have been between 30 and 40, I would guess. 30 and 40? Yeah. I would and how guess. well attended were they? Um, very well attended. As, as we went on, we would get between, well, some of cases was over 80 people, I think. When there were over 100 in, in yeah. some of them. So, you know, it varied depending on where we were. I mean, we went all over Scotland. We went right up to the north and right down to the borders. I mean, it depended where we went. And what was the result of the meeting? Was there any action taken at the end of the meeting? or? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, com we compiled... Um, evidence from families who had attended uh, the meeting. Several of them spoke about their experiences. They spoke publicly to a certain extent, but didn't want to obviously um, compromise their, their children's privacy. So they, they did send us details of what had happened to them afterwards, which we've kept as evidence. It, it gave families an opportunity to um, um, speak about, you know, to know that the one that they weren't alone, but to, to give them the opportunity to speak to, to people about what was happening to them and look for ways to um, to counter 
what was happening, because in a lot of cases it was actual harm, you know, in terms of their um, data being shared and the consequences of that. I mean, you know, I dealt with one family who were um, referred four times in one academic year to the children's panel. And so, you know, cases of that, I mean, the, the effect on the family of that, and we're talking about a sick child involved in that as well. So, I mean, the effects of this is, you know, it is trauma in a lot of cases. Okay, thank you. Angus, Donald. Okay, thanks. Um, Camille, good morning. Leslie, good morning, Alison. Um, just following on from uh, Ronan Mackay's uh, questioning there, um, you've stated that at all these meetings since 2013, um, you heard about unlawful data collection and sharing, uh, which has led to a loss of trust uh, in services among families. So, I mean, you've given us one example there just now, but are, are there any other specific cases, obviously without mentioning any names uh, or details, that, that you can give us um, uh, with regard to the circumstances around the data which has been shared? Um, <clears throat> I can think of one a very recent case, um, a family who had been referred for the first time to social work, uh, allegedly on child protection grounds, which weren't because it was it was based on well-being concerns, because they declined the services of a health visitor that they didn't get on very well with. The health visitor then alerted housing because they lived in social housing in the east end of Glasgow, and housing came to inspect her house, which she found violating, humiliating. Um, the children's panel had already thrown this out in previous years, but it was escalated uh, further, and there was a, such a determination to, to build a case against this family who, whose only well-being need was a bigger house because they were overcrowded, but that, that hasn't appeared. There was no practical help whatsoever. So eventually it was escalated to, a con to an initial conference um, at which I advocated and I was delighted to say that social work maintained the threshold that should be maintained, which was risk of significant harm, and no further action was taken. Uh, but it was totally traumatising for the family who have young children, they have six children, two, two of whom have grown up. Very traumatising for the family, and uh, they, they really do want their voices to be heard. Okay, and could you um, expand a little on, on, on what people have told you um, why this has led to, to a loss of trust? Well, but the, I mean, certainly, um, I'm with a charity that deals with neurological disease, ME, and in, in that situation, what you're finding is that um, information um, from parents has not been given any weight, but the information from any professional involved is, and this is repeated not just with people with ME, but the, the, the information, part of the, this process is that you don't have to repeat your story to professionals, you know, it's taken once and then they repeat it and share it amongst themselves. But if the information is wrong, then that, it's the wrong information that's getting shared and repeated. And parents aren't being given the chance to correct it. They lose confidence in the, in the process and practices around them. And they lose trust because the resulting procedures and actions that are put in place are not helping them, they're actually harming them. Thank you. Rachel Hamilton. Good morning. Um, I was actually at one of your meetings in East Lothian um, at the time, um, and which I found very useful. And uh, what, what I'd like to know, uh, furthering from Rona Mackay's question, is the 90 submissions of uh, written evidence that you got, were they part of those meetings or were they separate? And how did you go about, um, did, you, did you go directly to people or did people come to you? Um, that was a separate thing that Alison and, and I set up. That was uh, Times Trust and Scottish Home Education Forum, because um, we um, were excluded from giving evidence to the Education and Skills Committee at the time. So we decided to take our own evidence because parents weren't being given a chance to tell their stories, which is why we feel we need a public inquiry. So we set this up on our own. And we just put out the word that if you have a story where your information has been shared illegally or there's an experience you, need to, you would like us to know due to GERFEC, um, you know, then give it to us and we set up a website and um, we had a public meeting as well and so we, we got floods of evidence then through through the website. Okay, so you, you actually, your, your evidence gathering was directly through a plea through the website? 
Yeah, it was, it was we, we put it through a uh, notary person, put out uh, an email and Facebook posts as well, inviting people to give evidence to us. And uh, but we did, we, it was a, a direct request to parents and families to, to give us their experiences. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Peter. Um Yes, um, I'm, I'm just slightly puzzled. You, you referred to the intense engagement that the Deputy First Minister committed to. And you questioned the extent to which the organisations engaged by the Scottish Government fully reflected the range of views in these matters or focused on organisations who were supportive in principle of the wellbeing agenda and compulsory name person scheme underpinned by GERFIC and the Curriculum for Excellence. I'm slightly confused by that. Um, are, are, you, are you supportive in principle of GERFIC and the Curriculum for Excellence? Um, no, because we've seen what's what's resulting from the practice on the ground. So no, we're not. I think, I think if anybody would say getting it right for every child is great, but there's no definition of it, and there's no definition of right. That's the problem. Once the state decides what what right, what well-being means, we we have a major problem, because it is open to such wide wide interpretation. Did you did your organisation make an effort to contact? Um, the organisations that the government were engaging with to tell them about what was happening? Or, or new yeah, yes, we, we, work, we work quite a lot with uh, various third sector organisations uh, who support children and families, but um, they, they all seem to be bought into it, apart from clan child law, which, which did express the same concerns that we did about the law, because we, we had a a very significant legal opinion from someone who instructed in, a, in a, an important case in, in Haringey just before the threshold was lowered in Scotland. We did point that out to all the other organisations, to the government and to MSPs, but really that, that was dismissed. And it turned out that the legal opinion we submitted in the first stage of the consultation to the 2014 Act, um, the, the, the lawyer that we commissioned to write it, uh, used exactly the same case law and exactly the same arguments which were finally um, agreed with by the Supreme Court. I mean, well-being sits at the heart of GERFIC and as the Supreme Court said, well-being is undefined. It, you know, Shinari is used to define it, but Shinari is undefined. It's totally subjective. And as the evidence that was given to the Education and Skills Committee by many practitioners, nobody has, you know, there is no universal definition of well-being that everybody accepts. You get groups of people uh, within an organisation who maybe have a, a, a collective understanding within their own group of what it is, but you take it out with that and then you're met with another definition of it. You know, you can't base anything on something that's so totally undefinable. So just to clarify, you are supportive of GERFEC, but it's the well-being um, aspect of it that you're... I just say question. we're supportive of, of obviously promoting safeguarding the well-being of children. I mean, who wouldn't be? The Supreme Court was supportive of that. What we're not supportive of are the measures that are being implemented to, to direct parents to promote the well-being in a specific way. That's where the problem lies, and that's why the judgment went the way that it did. Um, that, you know, I, I, I don't want to get bogged down in legal terminology, but... Sorry, the judgment was referring to the data protection, data sharing element of it. It wasn't, it it wasn't refer referring to the, the It referred to human it. rights and how human rights interact with data protection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Maurice Corey. Uh, Good morning, ladies. Um, in the petition you mentioned, and I quote, that many families were unaware of the rollout of the scheme, let alone the existence of any single point of contact in so-called trial areas. Do you have any view as to why people uh, were unaware of the scheme? We have minutes from a meeting that showed that it was rolled out purposefully, um, quietly, so that it could be implemented before uh, families were told about it. it. It was to be embedded across services before um, families were told about it. This is in, in government minutes. It was out. Yeah, well, well, I mean, that the Highland pilot um, was much lauded, but uh, nobody actually knew who the named person was or what, what the point of contact was. What they were finding was they were, they were having services forced upon them they didn't want, and they were, they were meeting gatekeepers to services that they did want, and that, that's where, where the problem lay, really. I mean, we did a, a meeting up in Highland and in Inverness, and when you talk to people there, 
um, and that, that was a few years after um, the supposed implementation of it, and they had no idea. They just didn't know what a named person was. They'd never met one. And if a named person is meant to be your central contact, if you have an issue or a problem and you don't know they exist, how can you approach them with a the problem? Did many people know who the named person no, was? No, they didn't even know it existed. In fact, um, as a home educator, um, I know that families have actually had to put in freedom of information requests to find out who the point of contact is for home educating families. And we have had um, redacted information back just giving us the Director of Children's Services. And there is supposed to be a point of contact there always has since 20, uh, 2007 from statutory guidance on home education. But we still don't know who they are. Right, thank you. Rona, you want to come in briefly? Just on, on that point, did you contact the local authority in Highland, um, who clearly did know um, what the name person scheme was, um, and did you put your, your uh, concerns to them? Yes. Um, various people put in complaints, but they, they were never recorded anywhere. And we're still finding with certain local authorities that when parents put in complaints, they're not recorded as such and that they're ignored, and that means that the ombudsman can't take on the case because the complaints uh, system hasn't been gone through. But if an authority won't accept something as a complaint, they, they actually have to then go to judicial review. There's no other alternative. So there is no complaint system, no acknowledgement um, that, that parents are complaining. So that the, that responsibility does lie with the local authority? Yeah, well, well, it should, well we, we think so. We'd like to think so. Yeah. Donald? Okay, thanks. So just to clarify one point there, um, the complaints that went into Highland Council um, weren't, weren't acknowledged. Is that what you're saying? But they weren't acknowledged. They weren't, um, they, they weren't acknowledged by the, the head of services at the time who said that nobody had complained about it, which wasn't actually true because we have copies of complaints um, from parents to Highland Council that went unacknowledged and unresponded to. Uh, it's good to get that on the record. Um, we, we, we know that, um, um, as you've identified in your petition, the Education and Skills Committee is the, the lead committee for uh, the scrutiny of the Children and Young People Information Sharing Bill. Mm -hmm. uh, and that committee has concluded that it can't give further consideration to the bill until, it's, uh, until it has an opportunity to scrutinise the accompanying draft code of practice on information sharing. Um, so, what's your understanding of any, any progress on the Code of Practice and the membership of the expert panel set up to guide and oversee the drafting of the Code? Well, I mean, the situation we're talking about is, is currently happening and, and has happened, so I mean, it's a, it's a historical situation and a current situation. So, you know, what happens with the Code of Practice, whilst important for going forward, doesn't really um, affect this because this, uh, you know, this is historic and current practice that we're talking about. We, we want the, the, the wrongdoing that's happened in the past and currently to be acknowledged and, and addressed in, in some way so that, so that parents have some sort of access to, to justice which has been denied them. Okay, thanks, convener. Okay. Can I maybe just, in, to wrap this up, ask you how you envisage an independent inquiry uh, would or should work and what its remit would or should be? I mean, is there, is there a kind of a, a standard that you would establish in terms of what that public inquiry would look like and what sort of time scale would you imagine it would be working to? We have uh, discussed this and we actually feel that probably an independent QC with, uh, with a track record in human rights would be the ideal person to chair such an inquiry and to, to invite uh, evidence from, from people who do know about this particularly. Uh, lawyers, because uh, the law clearly is, is what's important here. Human rights and data protection and how they, they interact. That's the bit that people are finding difficult and that is why the independent panel are struggling. If you read the minutes, which are you know partial really, um, you, you can see there's some tension there between the law and policy, which, which is obvious and I think the committees have been wrestling with that too. Uh, it is a very specialised area. I've spent the past 15 years uh, looking into it because I, was, uh, I worked on the, the contact point campaign in England, which was eventually abolished in 2010. And I also um, campaigned against the, the Snippers Charter, which 
you know, the same thing applied to legitimate aim, uh, totalitarian measures to implement that aim. I don't think we'd want to be a, a long time, so because obviously Gerfec has, in practice, been on the ground for quite some time now. So uh, families, you know, have been waiting a long time for for recompense. So I know the short. I don't know what the shortest time scale we could look at, you know, practically would be, but the shorter, you know, the better, I would suggest. Thank you. Rachel, briefly, and then we'll come to conclusion. Okay, could I just ask about the draft code, convener? Um, Ms Scott, you talked about um, the, when Angus MacDonald asked you about the accompanying draft code of practice, um, and just in some of the evidence, I just wanted to pick up on that because the committee had concluded that it would not be able to reach a conclusion on the bill until it was able to consider the draft code. Can you expand on what you said? Well, what, what, we're, what, we're, this, what we're asking for is an inquiry into historic and current practice. So the, the code of practice and the deliberations over that are, are not affecting current practice because GERFEC is in place. It has been in place for quite a number of years now um, across Scotland. It just, you know, there's been varying um, implementation. That was the whole purpose of the legislation. It was a consistency in implementation. It wasn't to introduce a new practice because that practice was already on the ground. So what we're asking for is an inquiry into that. The, the code of practice, however it comes out, whatever the draft code looks like, isn't affecting now or the, the historic situation, but these families need need to be heard and need recompense and the practices need to be brought to light. Okay, so do you believe that the, the bill should have been considered earlier? It shouldn't have been, it, the, the, it shouldn't have been implemented, you know, um, as it was, but it was rolled out before it became, the legislation came after it had already been implemented. Um, can I thank you very much for that? I think that has been um, certainly an interesting exploration of, of, of the issues. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Angus? Um, well, I think in the, the first instance, uh, convener, we need to contact the Scottish Government to, to seek its views on, on the action that's been, been called for. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it would be helpful also to write to the Information Commissioner's Office to seek their views as, as well um, with regard to the petition. And I think the point we'd be making to the government is not about future solutions, but what they're going to do to address this concern that practice took was driving certain kind of behaviour, which maybe hadn't been at that point legislated for. So I think it'd be worthwhile um, speaking to Scottish Government, asking, writing to Scottish Government with that, as you've said, the Information Commissioner, anything else? No. no. Yeah, um, that. Uh, let me get this right. Sorry, that the education director remained. Um, there was an unanswered document um, that Alison Pierce had talked about. I don't know if there's anything that we can do to um, to get that information. It has been requested. The NSP has now actually taken that up with the director. She said that she would she would write to them. Uh, I haven't heard, uh, heard back yet. Up in, in the correspondence that we feel there's so, some simple, simply not responding, which is quite different from responding in a way that you don't like, but simply not responding is a, a kind of frustrating thing in itself. Okay, I think if we can agree then, um, we write to Scottish Government, we give them a, a, an indication of the issues that have been raised um, and ask them to, to respond to that. But I think underlining the point that this is not about the future and how that matter is going to be sorted, but what they're going to do to address. And if they do think there's a concern, as has been flagged up, um, how they're going to address that and write to the Information Commissioner as well. And obviously, when those responses are received, you will have an opportunity to reflect on them and, and put a further submission to the committee. So can I thank you very much for your attendance today? I think that's been a very useful session and I'll suspend briefly um, until we allow the witnesses to leave the table. Thank you.
And can we move now to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1691 on the review of the Title Conditions Scotland Act 2003, submitted by Christopher R. Hampton on behalf of the Steering Group of Bowman's View. Members have a copy of the petition and the briefing prepared by Spice and the Clerks, which provides background on the Title Conditions Scotland Act 2003 and notes that the Scottish Government has recently indicated to SPICE that there is no current plans to change the law contained in Section 64 of the Act as it applies to sheltered housing complexes or otherwise. I wonder if members have any comments or, action, or suggestions for action. I should say that uh, I actually was a Member of Parliament in the Scottish Parliament when this was considered, and I think there are quite interesting issues here about um, the conditions are, are, or the burdens that are placed um, in certain um, complexes and the inability to move to another factor. And I think particularly this idea that you need to get two-thirds of majority to be able to uh, remove a, a factor um, is one of them. So I'm, I remember at the time it being highly technical and there was a lot of concerns and, and issues around that at that time in terms of protecting the characteristics of a sheltered housing complex. But I think it is something that Certainly, I find some of the argument in the petition quite compelling. Uh, Rachel? Um, because uh, I was surprised to see that um, the property owners can only vary the terms um, rather than remove them at all, um, and that there were also minimum age uh, requirements as well. So I think there is a case to take this forward. Yeah, um, I think, judging by, by my casework, uh, there's, there's certainly a, a, a strong argument for um, at the petitioner's viewpoint, um, but I'm, I'm struck by the uh, Justice Committee's report from 2013, mm -hmm. uh, in which it, it noted that the complexity of the current law can, can create barriers to switching property factors. However, um, in the response to the report from the Scottish Government, um, they, uh, set, they, they, they came to view that no change to Section 64 is required, but I think clearly it's maybe time to, for, for them to look at that again. Um, so happy to, to move this petition forward. Okay. Anyone else? I, I totally agree with Angus. I think, I think this petition does raise important issues. And I think, you know, for, I hadn't realised the aspects and uh, the effects in sheltered housing, but I think generally, um, on a more general level, that there, there is a... Um, you know, a concern about um, factors and, and how um, democratic the whole process is to go about changing them. But with regards to this petition, I think it's time we, we, we moved it on and, and, and asked us this, we could ask the Scottish Government, the Law Commission, Law Society of Scotland for their views and, and to move it on from there. Exactly. Okay. That's agreed. We will agree to write to the Scottish Government, the Scottish Law Commission and the Law Society of Scotland seeking the respective views and the action called from the petition. And of course, um, people are able to then respond to the submissions from then. Okay, if I can thank you for that and if we can then move on to the last new petition for consideration today which is petition 1697 <coughs> on the Child Funeral Fund by Michael Maguire. The petition calls for the Scottish Government to establish a Child Funeral Fund similar to the fund the UK Government has established in England and Wales. As members will be aware from the Clark's note, the Scottish Government has recently announced funding which will remove all local authority charges for burials and cremations for people under the age of 18. The petitioner has indicated that the Government's announcement addresses the action he is calling for in his petition and is therefore content for the petition to be closed. In correspondence received by the Clarks, the petitioner expresses gratitude to the Scottish Parliament for the consideration given to his petition. He also highlights the impact of the government's decision the, the government's decision will have for many people, which he states is reflected in the comments section of this petition. The petitioner all wishes, also wishes to highlight his own personal experience as a bereaved parent. He explains that when he lost his son, Kyle, he had to go back to work three days after the funeral for financial reasons. Because of this, the petitioner states that he missed out on vital time to grieve over the death of his son and to be there for his wife which is an impact he still feels nine years on. The petitioners are of the view that the government's announcement will be, quote, far-reaching and help so many families at a time where the lights have simply gone out in their lives. And I wonder, um, I think, I don't know if people have any comments ahead of us um, reflecting on the desire of the petitioner to close the petition. Rachel? Sympathy um, for this petition and, um, you know, 
we can tell by some of the comments from the petitioner um, how strongly it, he felt and how he was speaking on behalf of many other people in the same situation. And um, I'm just pleased that the Scottish Government have announced that they'll remove all local authority charges for burials and cremations for those under age 18. And, and because he is content, I think that on the basis that he's indicated that he, he's content to close the petition, is that we should um, go, with the, go along with those lines. Okay. Is that agreed? Yeah. Um, so we're agreeing that we close the petition understanding order rule 157 on the basis that the petitioner has indicated that he wishes to withdraw the petition and it is um, good to note that he's withdrawing it not out of frustration but a recognition that he has secured progress and I think we would want to thank the petitioner. It's not always easy, I'm sure it's, it's never easy to be able to take your individual experience and try and make a difference for other people but he has done that out of his own dreadful circumstances and I think we are grateful to the Scottish Government to responding to that because I think, he's, as he says, this will make a difference to the lives of um, people who are, who are grieving. So on that basis we are agreeing to with, um, that the petition be closed. Agreed? Um, in that case I'll suspend briefly until we get government officials to join the table. And call the meeting back to order and we move to the next item on our agenda which is the consideration of continued petitions. We last considered petition 1619 on access to continuous glucose monitoring by Stuart Knox at our meeting in March when we agreed to write to the Scottish Government, NHS boards and the Scottish, Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network and the petitioner. Responses have now been received and are included in our meeting papers. Members will also recall that we previously agreed to invite the Scottish Government to provide evidence on this petition. It was anticipated that the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, Shona Robertson, would be in attendance for today's evidence session. However, as the Committee will be aware, the Cabinet Secretary resigned from her position on Tuesday of this week and therefore will not be present at our meeting today. But I think we would want to record our thanks to Shona Robertson, who has been someone who has been willing to engage with the Petitions Committee over the time of her um, responsibilities as Cabinet Secretary and we want to wish her well in her new role. I am, however, pleased to welcome Professor Jason Leach, National Clinical Director, Healthcare Quality and Strategy, Gillian Gunn, Team Leader, and Richard Shearer, Senior Policy Officer from the Scottish Government Strategy Planning and Clinical Priorities Team. Can I thank you for attending the meeting today 
Um, and as you'll be aware, you have up to five minutes to make an opening statement if you wish to do so, after which we'll move to questions from the committee. Morning, Kavina. Thank you very much for having us and uh, forgive the short notice change of personnel. Let me, uh, let me outline the present position for you and then I'll be very happy to take questions as best I can. I know how difficult it can be to manage diabetes. I'm a dentist and oral surgeon. I'm a clinician. I have been for 26 years. With this in mind, we must ensure that health technologies used have clear evidence of their safety and clinical and cost effectiveness with appropriate evidence-based guidelines on their use. Before we go further, maybe I should clarify the difference between two technologies. I, I'm sure the committee have grasped this over their months of looking at this subject. Between continuous glucose monitors, CGMs, and flash glucose monitorings, which is Freestyle Libra as the example that you've uh, been looking at. They are two different types of devices. Without technical details, continuous glucose monitorings have a strong evidence base. They provide alarms and warnings of impending hypoglycemic attacks and can be used in conjunction with insulin pumps. Freestyle Libra, a flash glucose monitor, cannot be used like this. It doesn't provide real-time continuous glucose monitoring or alarming. We took the step of referring this topic to the Scottish Health Technologies Group, which is our organisation that looks at independently looks at the evidence available both clinically and cost-effectively. The current position is that seven NHS boards have included Freestyle Libra in their local formulary. I look forward to the advice statement from the Health Technology Group, which I expect in July, to assist the remaining NHS boards in identifying how they may best consider adoption of this technology in an open, equitable and manageable process. We've encouraged those boards who have introduced it to share their experience with other boards and we've asked those boards to ensure they accurately record the introduction of all diabetes devices into our Sky Diabetes system, which is one of our best e-health and technology systems we have to help inform that developing evidence base. I'm happy to take any questions, Camilla. Thank you very much. And can I welcome Emma Harper, MSP, um, for this item on the agenda? Can maybe I uh, start off? Um, one of the issues the committee heard during its fact-finding visit on the petition last year was that there had been delays in relation to NHS boards receiving the initial £2 million funding during 2017-2018. I wonder if you um, can respond to that issue. So I'll let uh, Gillian deal with the delay in inverted commas. The funding was for continuous glucose monitoring and pumps, not for flash glucose monitoring. Two different things. So the, the funding that went to the boards was for continuous glucose monitoring and insulin pumps. Can I ask, you said um, delay in inverted commas, are you, are you arguing there wasn't a delay? I, I simply don't know, that's why I was going to ask Jill. Okay. There's been no delay in issuing the funds that were announced and committed to by um, the ministers. Uh, the funds went out on time um, for the beginning of the financial year in 2017 and again in this financial year. Somebody has got it wrong then, there's not been a delay. There has been no delay um, from the Scottish Government issuing the funds to all health boards, as described in the director's letters of last year and this year. Okay. Um, we also received evidence from the NHS Fourth Valley, stating that they had to revise how they planned to spend their allocated funding due to VAT not being included. I wonder if you can clarify this position and whether the guidance is sufficiently clear to health boards in relation to actual funding available to them. So the funding that was allocated to the boards for insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitors did not include VAT. Boards have um, funded the VAT from within their own uh, resources. Uh, the funding for insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitors is to buy the technologies um, and to increase the amount of people receiving uh, CGMS and insulin pumps for adults. If we were going to quantify what the £2 million meant, you had to then calculate in what the boards would then have to find in terms of VAT? So there are differences for each boards in how they fund the technologies. The amounts that have been given will depend on which technologies they buy for the individual people. So there are a range of continuous glucose monitors that are available and there are a range of insulin pumps that are available and boards will purchase the one most appropriate to the person, the individual that they're seeing. Reasonable. If the Scottish Government is providing funding that they would factor in how much that extra would cost to deliver it. I mean, it doesn't seem to me to be reasonable to say 
we're giving you this amount of money to address a problem, but as a consequence of us giving you this money, you're then going to have to find more money. Presumably what most health boards have to do, when there isn't much money, is to incorporate the cost of VAT into the amount they've been given, and there will be a reduction, perhaps, in the expectation of those who be able to be helped. So they have... So they have the money to spend uh, as they want on this subject. Let's, let's be careful not to confuse that with this petition. This petition is about flash glucose monitoring. The, the freestyle... I'm, asking, I'm not confusing the issue. Please so forgive me. I understand because we've been given the evidence of what the difference is. I'm asking you that when the Scottish Government provides funding, do they calculate at that point what the implications are going to be in terms of VAT and therefore provide a transparent a report on how much money or how many people are going to be able to be helped by the monies that are being provided. Along with a commitment and a target for the number of people who would then get insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitoring, that number is public and published, and we are on target to meet those numbers. That includes the cost of VAT Correct. then? Correct. So to suggest then that as NHS Fourth Valley State, they are mistaken in thinking that they were getting X amount of money to provide X amount of support but then discovered they had to pay the VAT as well. They're mistaken in that regard. Your calculations... I'm not, suggesting they're, I'm not suggesting they're mistaken. I'm suggesting that the money they got to meet their target, for lack of a better expression, for continuous glucose monitoring and insulin pumps has enabled them to reach their target. That will have to include VAT. It included VAT. So when they say they didn't realise that, they're wrong. No, I'm sure they, they're telling the truth that they didn't realise that. I, I'm not suggesting they're lying. They're just ill-informed? Uh, perhaps there's a misunderstanding between the, the two organisations, us and them. Is this an unusual situation where VAT is factored in or not factored in? The, the technologies that are purchased by the National Health Service, some of them, many of them, include VAT. When we give money for a specific purpose, such as this, which we actually don't do very often, we give boards a block grant in order for them to spend for the health of their population. This money for a specific technology came with aims and targets for each board to meet. That has to, has to include the cost of the whole technology. So your targets were informed by the costs in terms of VAT? Correct. So it's not the case that the health boards would then have to find the money separately for VAT, but, which is what we heard earlier? But that would be my understanding. I'm very happy to talk to Fourth Valley and correct any confusion. I mean, it does seem to me to be quite a significant issue, and I'm not sure we seem to have got two separate messages from the evidence we've got already, but let me move on to uh, Angus MacDonald, and maybe we'll come back to that point. OK, thanks, um, Convener. Good morning uh, to the panel. Um, taking on board your clarification um, regarding funding for continuous glucose monitoring, um, when the committee was... When we were on our fact-finding visit to Dumfries and Galloway a few months ago, um, we discussed the cost of using glucose monit monitoring technology uh, compared to traditional pinprick uh, blood tests. And we heard from diabetes uh, sufferers and pharmacists that there, there wasn't much of a, a cost difference, but a consultant that we met uh, suggested that there was. Now, um, this suggestion took account of access to peripherals, such as uh, testing strips. So c can you clarify for us what cost analysis uh, you've undertaken in relation to the costs of pin pricking uh, compared to continuous glucose monitoring and flash glucose monitoring? Richard, um, <coughs> in terms of continuous glucose monitoring, um, because of the population that that's targeted at, it's matching the technology to the individual that's most important. And so we know it costs more. Um, but it's because of the additional features it has, such as the alarms and the ability to be linked to a pump. So the cost analysis on that basis is more around what it actually costs to deliver. We know that there's an offset against it. Um, and in terms of flash glucose monitoring, there's a, a point at which it becomes the same or, or, or lower cost than finger pricking, and that is between eight to 10 finger pricks a day. So someone who is doing less than eight finger pricks it costs marginally more for flash and beyond that it costs marginally less because there's a fixed cost around flash because it doesn't matter how often you scan the cost of scanning doesn't increase but if you finger prick then each test strip there's a cost attached to it okay, okay. Um, 
Thank you. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, the committee notes that uh, we noted that the guidance provided uh, to NHS boards for the 2017-18 on future funding states that there will be an increased emphasis on continuous glucose monitor devices. However, the more recent 2018-19 guidance does not contain uh, a similar statement. Could you explain, as a panel and individually, uh, why this is the case and what other guidance NHS boards may be being provided with regarding the future funding of these devices? The initial letter um, went out at a time that we'd planned to um, initiate fewer CGM in the first year than we ended up doing. So after that letter, there was some discussion with boards who had identified less, marginally less people for insulin pumps than they were able to identify for CGM. So we ended up funding 50% more roughly CGM in the first year than we had planned. And so we're now on a trajectory of, of initiating around about the same or slightly more each year rather than the increasing trajectory that we'd originally planned on. Uh, I, have no, I have nothing else other than to, to say it's, it's important, as with all new technologies such as CGM, to use it in the appropriate people. It's, it's quite a small number of people who benefit from that much more expensive technology. It, it's people who would have regular hypoglycemic attacks who can't notice when their blood sugars are going off, for lack of a better word. So the alarming, the slightly more invasive nature of the continuous glucose monitoring to, to start it off is very, very useful in that small group of people because we can then link it technologically to the insulin pump to control their insulin. Right. OK. Thank you. What, the, 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 lead, yeah. the phased approach for continuous glucose monitors um, is enabling us to make sure that we've got a workforce that are skilled appropriately as well. Um, that's an important part of introducing new technologies. Then is the ambition to end eventually pinprick testing? <clears throat> globally, you mean, or or for us? No, not globally. No. So, so I, it would appear with the present technologies available that pinprick monitoring will continue for uh, the foreseeable future until cheaper technology and easier technology becomes available. But it could, it would be recognised as less than optimal for people to be getting pinprick testing. I mean, if you, if you discount the issue of cost. In, indeed. If we, if we can find a technology, if the diabetes community, patients, families and medical staff, can find a technology that fulfils that purpose that is non-invasive, that will be a big, a big change. And we appear to be in a period of technological advancement that is moving us towards that. Okay. Rona Mackay? So, so CGM, for example, requires calibration through finger pricking um, on a daily basis. And there's rules with the DVLA um, around finger currently around finger picking and driving. So the future we would hope, as Jason says, to have a non-invasive approach. Um, but currently the technology that we have all requires finger pricking still. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. I understand from reports I've read that we're not all that far from that technology being available. Is that correct? And I'm talking about the matter of maybe a couple of years. In terms of the um, artificial pancreas, do you mean? Yeah. Well, um, yeah there's, there's not having to pinprick, basically, in layman's terms. Um, potentially, but the artificial pancreas is still in an early testing stage. Um, and so, as with all technology, you'd expect it to go through comprehensive clinical trialling, and then there's the rollout, there's the ability for manufacturers to, to achieve the scale of numbers that we would require. And then there's the clinical appropriateness of any technology for the, the particular subgroup of the conditioner. OK, thank you. Okay. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning. Professor Leach, you mentioned in your opening statement that the Scottish Health Technologies Group are undertaking a national appraisal of Freestyle Libra as there a lack, as there's a lack of published data about the clinical and cost effectiveness of flash glucose monitoring. Can you explain why Freestyle Libra was added to the Scottish drug tariff if there was insufficient information of its clinical <coughs> or cost effectiveness? So the Scottish Drugs Tariff is a different bar from then getting to formularies. So the Scottish Drug Tariff requires safety and no detriment, uh, but it doesn't take account of clinical effectiveness and cost effectiveness. So it's the first step towards delivery as a prescribed medicine or device. So the next step is then local formularies in the boards 
local formula committees in the board decide yes or no for their local formularies. That is informed by local evidence from it, investigators, by pharmacists, by clinicians in that room. But then we try and help that nationally by doing national investigations using the SIGN guidelines, using the SMC for drugs and for devices such as this, we use the Scottish Health Technology Group. And that's happened pretty quickly from when it joined the tariff in November. We've now, in July, going to get a report from the Health Technologies Group, which will give us more evidence or a combined evidence that will allow us then to go back to boards and continue the journey. For clarification, so it's added to the drug tariff before those, it's added first before those, uh, that's been scoped out? Correct. Yeah, okay. Um, Same as in the other four UK, each, each country has its own drugs tariff. So you get, for medicines, you get European approval, then you get individual country approval in the drugs tariff, and then it is added to formulary. So in England, the CCGs decide what's in the formularies regionally, and in Scotland, the health boards decide what's in the formularies. Okay, thank you. Um, you, you, you say that the appraisal is due to be published in July. Have you had any engagement with the group on the findings so far, and, and have you any indication of, of what that might, what the findings might be? They, they act independently, quite deliberately. They're a part of Healthcare Improvement Scotland, but they take independent evidence, they take independent witnesses, and I, I'm expecting it, I'm led to believe I'll get it in the next few weeks. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Rachel Hamilton. He had letters written to me from constituents about Freestyle Libra, but, and I did receive a letter from Shona Robson in April. Um, and the Scottish Government, it says that the Scottish Government is increasing the access to continuous glucose monitors, which when used in combination with insulin pump therapy have been clinically proven to significantly reduce ABA1C levels and hyperglycemic episodes. Um, and in the... 17 and 18 um, guidance that was provided to NHS board, it um, stated that there was increased emphasis on continuous glucose, mon monitoring, glucose monitoring devices. But in the recent 1819 guidance, that does not contain a similar statement. And I just wondered why that was the case and also um, what other guidance the NHS boards were being given on funding if both years were differing. <coughs> What we sought to do with the second letter, the 1819 letter, was not to just repeat the 1718 letter. So, um, to make it simpler for boards, the, the, the principles have been established with the first letter and the first round of funding. And so, what we sought to do was to just um, to clarify where there are similarities with the first year, so it's the same target group, and to set out what the funding was, um, just to reduce the, the, the scale of the. The correspondence so that we had. To be clear, we still believe what was in the first letter. We believe continuous glucose monitoring connected to insulin pumps is appropriate for a small number of. It's not a useful. It's not a, a particularly pleasant phrase. The difficult to control group of di of diabetics, and and it provides a real step change in their lifestyles. They are they can live normal lives where previously they couldn't. So we still believe that technology to be clinically effective and cost effective in that group. Okay, so ca can you clarify um, really where the future is, even though you've got that, that um, as you've said, uh, difficult group uh, to control there um, and that treatment is appropriate for them. What is, what is the future and what is the future direction that you're taking NHS boards? DGF specifically. Mm. Um, what we are doing is on an annual basis, we review um, the guidance that we've issued in the terms of the group we're targeting our funding at with our national uh, diabetes specialist nurse who is focused on technology and who's assisting boards in the, the rollout and implementation of, of CGM and insulin pumps um, to make sure that we're still focused on the correct group. So it may be that as we move on, we move to the next priority group. If we've managed to, to issue and initiate CGM for the whole, you know, as many of the, the hypoglycemic unawareness group, for example, as are willing to take the technology on, then we'll look at the next clinically indicated group beyond that in terms of risk. Okay, and just to, to clarify, what's the guidance on the funding part of that f to the boards? The guidance on the funding of that will come in that, the annual director's letter. Right. So as we, if we get to the point at which we move to the next indicated risk group, then that will be contained in that director's letter. 
Thank you. In terms of the annual funding. Maharpa. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, I uh, am co-convener of the cross-party diabetes group. I also have type 1 myself. I'm a pump user and I'm an intermittent flash monitor uh, user as well. So I understand the technology and how it works and everything. And I also have a constituent who has a seven-year-old who isn't having seizures at night anymore when flash uh, monitoring was introduced. And that's fantastic. So uh, I'm curious about, though, how do we support the patients and the nurses, the staff, to educate them. NHS and Fries Galloway have set criteria in order to, uh, I guess, qualify people to obtain a flash monitor. They have to do six times tests a day. They have to agree to um, participating in the uh, uploading their results. They have to have attended the Daphne course, which is dose adjustment for normal eating. So it's very complicated, and I understand that, that uh, the staff will have to be trained if they're going to help support people with type 1. And uh, I'm just interested in what your thoughts would be about that. So you raise an important point on both sides of the new technology. Both the patients and the families have to be trained. That has implications for both them and for the diabetic nurses, the general practitioners. The, to presently, it's a secondary care provided uh, technology, so that has implications for who's going to train them. And then we have to ensure that our staff stay up with those technologies. The Scottish Diabetes Group, the third sector organisations help us with all of that. And it, it, it's absolutely correct that boards will set criteria for inclusion of whatever that new technology is, just like they would for insulin pumps, just like they would for any other home device for some other technology, dialysis or whatever else we were doing. We will provide guidance like we often do, either through Healthcare Improvement Scotland's work or the Scottish Government's work, to try and e equalise that guidance as best we can across those territorial boards. Just a, a quick sub as well. It's, um, I think, um, obviously, it's very complicated. I love the idea that technology is helping reduce finger sticks, because so many people obviously have pain. and. Uh, but I agree that we still have to continue to do finger stick as a way to calibrate flash, so it won't completely eliminate finger sticking, right? That's correct? That's correct. OK. All right. I imagine the companies are working tirelessly behind the scenes on technologies that will eventually replace the more invasive elements of diabetes care. Just now, the machines require a... a a test in order to calibrate against themselves. And when people go for secondary care diabetes care, they have actual blood tests, not pinprick tests. So, so in order to monitor their continuous care, we, we, they, they require blood testing. And I, I can't see a world quickly where that's going to disappear. And I'm assuming that as more and more people are introduced to CGM and flash, that then boards will be monitoring the haemoglobin A1C levels to show that there is an improvement, because long-term blood glucose control will reduce issues of all the complications associated with diabetes. So in the long term, it would be a cost savings correct. to... If, if, what you say is tr if what you say becomes true, correct. So that's why the Sky Diabetes thing is very important, and I'm relieved De Vries and Galloway want to know the data, because that allows Sky Diabetes, which monitors, as you know, you're probably on Sky Diabetes. Mm -hmm. Sky Diabetes monitors uh, eye problems, foot problems, hypoglycemic admissions, what, and, and we'll be able to relate that to the technology the individual is using, and that will give us more. So the Scottish Health Technology Group presently can really only look at published evidence. It doesn't have... Scotland-wide thousands of patients evidence, it would eventually have that. Okay. Can I maybe just, in, in conclusion, ask a, a couple of questions? Um, the committee has previously heard that the sign guidelines for diabetes type 1 management are out of date and have not kept up to date with technology, and I wonder how you would respond to that. We are engaging with Healthcare Improvement Scotland to look at the sign guidelines. We've sought advice from them on updating mm -hmm. those and are progressing that work with Healthcare Improvement Scotland and sign. So what would be the timescale for that? There isn't a timescale at the moment. Um, we're looking to see how sign guidelines may be updated. Uh, we are aware that NICE guidance has recently been updated um, and it's looking across all of the national guidance that's currently available. I want to take to answer that question more fully, convener. I'll ask them. Sorry? I'll ask them for a time. It would be very useful to know. I mean, 
I, a, I accept that there's, some of this may be a moving target, but to, to say you're going to do something is always helpful to have a time scale. And, and SIGN has a waiting list and a process for a pipeline for both new guidelines and updating its guidelines. So it will be in that pipeline somewhere. And they're also reviewing the nature of how they do guidelines exactly because of the pace of change within healthcare. So the traditional method of quite a long period of evidence gathering of sometimes two or three years, it, it, mo it moves, as you say, during that two or three years. So they, so they need a slightly more agile version of it. So it may be that they change their processes and that would help for diabetes care, it would help for asthma care, others. Okay, I think it would be useful to get more information. I, I understand absolutely the point that technology itself is a moving feast and you can sort in a problem when there's or maybe something already developed that changes the landscape completely. Finally, can I ask about, I um, understand that ministers have asked NHS boards to provide quarterly updates on the progress made in relation to the additional funding that we spoke about earlier. What does this information tell you and what do you understand the continuing challenges with health boards to be in relation to how they use the funding? So the information from boards tells us that they are um, on track to meet the targets that we've been setting. Um, in terms of future going forward, we know that the cost of these technologies has an impact on boards. This is why we've been supporting it nationally and we need to work with the boards as we progress through this period of funding so that they can embed it into their resources um, in the future. So it will be mainstreamed at a later stage? So insulin pumps for children are already mainstreamed. Um, the additional funding for adult pumps is to help them to further progress what's already mainstreamed within their budgets. And you're, you would be continuing to keep an eye on the targets and whether they've been yes. met? Okay, in that case, can I thank you very much for that and appreciate that you have had to come along at, at, at short notice. I appreciate the, your response to the questions. I wonder if we have comments for <coughs> or suggestions for action given what we have heard. Rona? We obviously reflect on the evidence that we've heard, which was, was very useful. Um, and, you know, we, we, we continue the petition until the national appraisal um, has been published um, shortly, and then we take stock of where we are at that point. I wonder whether it would be worthwhile at some point inviting the Cabinet Secretary, the new Cabinet Secretary, to come in to see if they're just to get an update from her perspective of where we might be mm -hmm. with this. Some of this feels like it's, some of it is testing whether the funding has been adequate in terms to meet um, the targets and whether there continue to be issues around that, but also in terms of the idea that guidance is behind the technology, what kind of progress there is, and that would be useful to hear as well. So we're agreeing to continue the petition um, and we'll reflect on the evidence we've heard today and it may be that we've factor in another session with the new cabinet secretary um, to respond to some of the no doubt the submissions that will follow this and of course as I've said before the petitioner will have a further opportunity to submit their comments on what we've heard today um, with that therefore can I thank again um, our witnesses today and I'll suspend them briefly to allow the officials to leave the table
meeting back to order and we're now moving on to the next two positions for consideration which are petition 1480 on Alzheimer's and Dementia Awareness by Amanda Coppell on behalf of the Frank Coppell Alzheimer's Awareness Campaign and petition 1533 by Jeff Adamson on behalf of Scotland Against the Care Tax on the abolition of non-residential social care charges for older and disabled people. As members will note from our papers, the petitioner for petition 1533 continues to express concerns about how money for free personal care will be distributed to people who need it, despite having met with the Scottish Government, which agrees to assess his proposals. The committee may also wish to note that regulations were recently approved by the Scottish Parliament with regard to the action called for in petition 1480 to extend free personal care to under 65s who require it regardless of that person's condition. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Angus? Yeah, uh, thanks, convener. I think um, given the, the, the positive progress with regard to uh, petition 1480, um, we could, uh, uh, on, uh, we, we could <coughs> close the petition um, Understanding mm -hmm. Orders Rule 15.7, given that uh, the Health and Sport Committee has recently approved regulations which address the action that, were, that, that was called for, yeah. uh, which is, you know, a, a extremely good news. Yeah. I certainly thought that we could, it would be reasonable um, to recognise the progress that's been made in that and close that petition. I personally think there's a lot left to explore around um, Scotland against the care tax issues, I think, in, our, um, in the evidence, it, it, this whole question of um, the definition of care, but the importance of care from a human rights perspective, somebody being able to go and work and achieve their potential, if they're being taxed on, you know, that the care tax is preventing them doing that, or they're denying themselves the support that they might need because they can't afford it. I think that it feels to me that we need more um, an exploration of those issues. I found the evidence in that one pretty compelling. Mm -hmm. I know that um, we might perhaps write to the Scottish Government because there are still some points that haven't perhaps been addressed that were recommended and that's how it's unclear how the money will be distributed and whether it goes directly to um, the person or to local authorities. So I think there are some unanswered questions still remaining. Yes. And they, they clearly, the petitioner feels quite strongly about that, that it, whether the, the, um, the, the proposals that they are, they've identified, you know, if, if the conclusion is that the money goes to local authorities and not directly to those who, who uh, need the support, then there would be a question there. Um, anyone else? Rona? I think that we, we could do with some more clarification on that side of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, while it's great news that um, the... the you know, the actions have been approved um, initially by the Health and Sport Committee. I think maybe there are still some questions that we, we could we could put around the, the other issue that you mentioned. Yeah. Yes, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a we get, let's get all the information on the table. Yeah, and, and I do think that when I was quite struck by the range of um, individuals and organisations that are supporting the second petition, um, and they come out of, I think, direct experience of... of I mean, I, I know myself there was um, a presentation where a young woman, a disabled young woman, was saying that, that her student loan was factored in in terms of income against what she might have to pay in terms of her own support. So I think that it may be something we want to explore further about whether we can afford a, um, a, situ a circumstance where people could maybe be brought together to look at these kinds of issues. But I think certainly in the, in, in the first stage, Social security powers too, it would be timely to, yeah. to do that. So, might I suggest then that we write to Scottish Government to seek an update on its assessment of the proposals put forward by Scotland against the care tax? I think in previous considerations there had been um, an issue about cost, but we, I don't know how confident we felt, felt about how rigorous the assessment of cost would be. And I know, I think, if I remember correctly, COSLA and local authorities had highlighted this. Um, so it would be useful to, for the Scottish Government maybe to reflect on that as well and to address this question, this broader question about the definition of care when people might need care that isn't simply about their personal care but it is about things that need support with in order for them to be able to, to, to work or whatever. 
So are we agreed that we're going to close petition uh, 1480, recognising the progress that's been made in that regard, but we'll also write to the Scottish Government to seek an update on the assessment of the proposals put forward by Scotland against the care tax. And again, I think we'd want to thank <coughs> um, Amanda Copo. I think everyone was aware of that campaign and how powerful it was um, under the impact of, of the petition that she took forward and the compelling way in which the case was argued by the campaign, that there has been progress, and we would um, thank her very much for that. But we would want to um, continue uh, petition 1533 in order that we're fully satisfied that their concerns have been addressed. If that's the case, we can move on to um, the next petition for consideration, or the next two petitions for consideration, are petition 1610 by Matt Halliday on upgrade of the A75, and petition 1657 by Donald McCarry on behalf of the A77 Action Group on the A77 upgrade. Can I welcome Finlay Carson to the table for consideration of this position and um, recognise Emma Harper as remains in position in order to participate in our consideration of this, these two petitions. Members will recall that our last consideration of these two petitions in March, reflected on the evidence heard from the Minister for Transport and Islands, and agreed to write to Scottish Government, hauliers and ferry operators. Responses have now been received and are included in our meeting papers. Members will note from this information that the petitioner raises concerns that the information used to decide the standard of road for the Mabel bypass was out of date and inaccurate. Written responses received also highlight a number of issues we have repeatedly heard from different stakeholders, including the HDV speed limit not being appropriate, particularly in relation to the A77, the quality of the road being poor, and competition from ports elsewhere in the UK threatening the long-term economic future of the ferry ports in the area. And I was quite struck by the number of submissions there were in this and the very substantial points um, that they were making. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I wonder if it's worthwhile maybe hearing from Finlay and Emma, and then we can grind the table. Uh, thanks, Convener. I think uh, it would just highlight the, 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 the real dire situation we'll be down in the South West with both the A75 and A77. Um, I think uh, this time of year, it certainly highlights the issues because we've got some parts of the A75, as we mentioned in one of the submissions from one of the ferry operators, about just the condition of maintenance on the road where we've got trees and vegetation right over the white line. So instead of the, the A75 getting wider, which we'd all like to see, it's grown narrower by feet every time uh, you've got new leaves in the trees. I, I, I took the opportunity to drive the route uh, with Dave Allen, the, 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 the route manager, in the autumn of last year and highlighted some of the areas where uh, you know, immediate maintenance was required. Uh, unfortunately, that hasn't been carried out and we've got stretches of the road which can't possibly uh, come up to the, the sort of standards that should be required of a, a trunk route of its status with regards to line of sight and, 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 and visual stopping distances and corners. And if nothing else, that needs to be addressed as, uh, seriously. Uh, we've now got lorries that are cutting the hedges and the, uh, the, the verges rather than them, them being cut back by contractors. And that's just unacceptable. Emma? Um, thank you, convener. Um, I am interested to hear today about, I guess, actions moving forward because both routes, the A75 and the A77, are um, really, really important for the economy of the, uh, the ferry ports and uh, Cairn Ryan and Stringer are the surrounding area. Um, and Finlay Carson has absolutely highlighted the issues in certain parts of the roads are really uh, troublesome because the uh, lorries do have a hard time passing each other. Um, I recently asked Minister Hamza Youssef about reviewing the speed limit from 40 miles an hour to 50 miles an hour at the request of a lorry driving constituent at Stranraer and uh, I guess that review will be welcome uh, related to the A9 and the speed cameras and the speed limits uh, increase there. So. For me, I'm just interested in keeping the petition open so that we can continue to look at improvements for the infrastructure in the southwest of Scotland. Finally. Just another point. Uh, we were led to believe that there was a, an additional piece of work coming forward 
uh, in, in the form of a review, and that was commissioned in March. However, it would appear that this review is only going to feed into the, the National Strategic Transport Review. Uh, so we're probably looking at actually three years before there's any conclusions to that. Um, so, you know, realistically, we're probably looking at six years before any action could be taken in the E75 uh, and E77, and I think that needs to be looked at seriously. It really needs to be accelerated, and in the process of doing the review, uh, it potentially just slowing the whole thing down. But uh, I spoke to someone, uh, and then said in Transport Scotland, they suggest it could be six years by the time the review was done, and if there was any work identified by the time it went through consultation and, and so on, it could be six years before any plans actually came onto the table, and that's totally unacceptable. Rachel? You convener, I noted that on the 29th of March uh, this year that um, the then Transport Minister had committed to increasing the um, speed limit, but then uh, subsequently the Scottish Government had said that there was no plan to increase the speed limit. We now have a new Transport Minister in Michael Matheson, um, and I, I mean, obviously you will guide the committee as to um, what we should do uh, follow it, following um, comments from the committee but um, perhaps it is in, in our best interest to you know get clarification on that considering the two members here have concerns um, regarding that Angus yes yeah, thanks um, Camina it's, it's certainly disappointing to note the comments from P&O uh, which uh, Finlay has, has alluded to um, who've, who've highlighted um, that the condition of both the A75 and A77 have significantly worsened over recent months, uh, and surface repairs haven't kept up with the uh, rate of deterioration. So um, we, we, we heard on our fact-finding visit when we were down in Dumfries and Galloway uh, of the potential loss of the ferry ports. Um, so, <clears throat> I mean, that's clearly a concern, and it's extremely disappointing to hear uh, that the condition of the roads have, have worsened, particularly given the coverage uh, that the petitioners have secured uh, during uh, the, the length of the petition and the fact that it has been on the government's radar. Uh, so, yeah, um, disappointed to, to, to hear these reports and uh, would share, share concerns that, uh, that have been expressed already. Think, Morris? Yes, I think the other thing, these two um, recommendations uh, I think are very appropriate, but also I think you should need to bear in mind the economic angle with which these road conditions, the poor road conditions just been highlighted, are endangering future viability of the economic corridor. Uh, and, you know, it could be a decision that's taken out of the government's hands by the commercial sector. We don't want to see that happen, and I think that was reflected by Emma and uh, Finlay. Okay. Um, Comments and then how we take it forward. I, mean, I certainly um, would think it'd be worthwhile asking the Scottish Government, I means very specifically the petitioner's concerns in 1657, that the information used to select the standard of road for the Mabel bypass was out of date and inaccurate. I mean, that's something we just want a response to. And what plans Ecom Limited has to engage both with the petitioners and the south, um, with both petitioners, sorry, on the South West Scotland Transport Study, because that feels like something that would be quite important to inform their, their thinking. So I think we could uh, agree to do that. Is there something more that we could perhaps be looking at in terms of really bring it? I mean, I think this economic thing has been something that has been a thread. It's not just about the roads, it's not just about uh, the frustration of individual drivers and the risk to people going up and down that road, but the actual economic impact of not moving more quickly on it is quite significant. Can we be guaranteed that Transport Scotland, with the recent appointment of the um, ACOM Limited, um, when they undertake the study and go out to stakeholders to get evidence regarding these roads, how can we be confident that there will be a, a, an economic impact um, part of, as part of that? Um, I, I mean, other than us taking our own evidence, but having just joined the committee, um, Angus MacDonald said that you had been down to Dumfries and Galloway. I don't know if that was specifically to speak to anybody that was involved in this. And what, was the economic um, yeah, impact discussed? So. It was, yeah. I mean, I, I agree. It's, I think it's, it seems to be slow, there's slow or no progress in this every time we discuss it. And I mean, Transport Scotland are saying the study's at an early inception stage, which raises alarm bells. It's just, that's just going to drag on and on. So I think we need to um, 
you know, right to Transport Scotland and, and, and point out the, the worsening state of the roads and, quite frankly, the urgency of this? Because I don't think the ports are going to wait forever. Um, Transport Minister to highlight that this has been an ongoing issue. We think it's something that, you know, particularly this issue about we're, we're, we're developing a project that's already not fit for purpose. I think that would, that would be a concern. I wondered whether it would be worthwhile to have a round table discussion in Parliament with the interested groups. Because I think that frustration about the issues there, people have identified it. But what is the action to get Transport Scotland and, and government officials along with stakeholders in it? I think there might be a useful way forward. Finlay? Uh, the, 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 one of the frustrating things, we know there's plans have been drawn up and we've had engineers look at some road improvements in the A75 and they were shelved for various reasons. So there are plans for, for some road improvements in the A75 or, already. And, you know, we've heard over and over that uh, economic argument. I, I just don't see that waiting six years uh, is acceptable when, when we know what the answers are to all these questions. Um, it, it would, I, th I think a round table would, would be a, a great opportunity to try and get some answers uh, and, and maybe ask the, the questions with regards to what section of the roads have had improvements um, you know, designed and engineered and, and they're, they're sitting on a shelf just waiting for someone to give them the nod. I, I've tried three times to get a freedom of information with regards to uh, how much land the uh, Scottish ministers own along the A75, to, and I've just been knocked back every time, suggesting it wasn't in the public interest, uh, which is utterly nonsense, given the, the number of respondents we've had for even this petition here. Uh, so a round table would certainly uh, give us the opportunity to get these questions on record and hopefully get some answers. Huh? I think it would be worthwhile finding out, actually, where the information is coming from that suggests that the ferry operators are considering alternative routes. I mean, are they? I don't know. It, the haulage companies seem to put that rumour out, and that would be pretty devastating, actually, if the ferries w did move. Um, I've been trying to find information r regarding that myself. Um, mm. I think it would be great, actually, if uh, the new transport minister would go and meet people at Cairn Ryan at the ferry terminal and get the views of the st stakeholders from actually taking the road to get there as, as well. So, Morris? Yeah, what, what can I ask, um, actually, to both of you, um, Emma and, uh, and Vin, um, what pressure has the Fries and Galloway Council put on Transport Scotland and indeed therefore Council, council members? I think we really need to involve them. Uh, well, once again, I've been quite disappointed that uh, I asked some questions to the Council about what lobbying they've done of the Scottish yeah. Government, and, and there's very little. Um, I know they've stepped up uh, somewhat in the last uh, few years, um, but the, the Council did put together a, a, a strategic plan for improvements to the A75 and the, the, the cost, uh, and, and I think that was produced maybe 15, 20 years ago. And again, it, it sat on the shelf, but. You know, some of the economic arguments have already been had and there, and there are documents laying out what improvements and, and when they should be scheduled. And that was in the back of uh, you know, the ferry uh, uh, terminals and, and the, the reduction in traffic potentially with uh, uh, dual carriages open up at Holyhead and, and Haysham. Yeah, well, I mean, sorry for experience, I have the problem with the 83 to gain Camel Town and the rest will be thankful. Unless the councils push hard, the individual councillors even, you get nowhere with Council Scotland. So I, I would say that's an important thing. Maybe bring Cosler in. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think your suggestion of a, a round table would help to keep the a government's mind concentrated on the issue. Or if it if it hasn't, it'll make sure it is. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd be keen to. Given the evidence that we took on the fact-finding mission, I'd be keen to make sure that uh, uh, P&O and Stenerline are, are included in the round table because I think it's uh, sig significant uh, their, their position at the moment. Yeah. Okay, I think that's been a, a useful consideration. We've highlighted the concerns of the petitioner um, on 1657. and We think we would be wanting that information and how they're going to be engaged with by e uh, Com Limited. We would also look at a roundtable discussion with relevant stakeholders and we'll take into account everything people have said about definitions of relevant stakeholders. And I think we would want to write to the Scottish Government particularly to highlight that this is a big issue in the new Minister's entry and we'd welcome any response from them as well. Okay. In that case, thank you very much and can I thank uh, Finlay Carson and Emma Harper for their attendance.
if we can then move on to the next petition, which is petition 1629 by Jennifer Lewis on MI MRI scans for ocular melanoma sufferers in Scotland. We last considered this petition in December 2017 when we agreed to write to Scottish <coughs> Government and the Chief Medical Officer on three issues as identified by the petitioner. The note by the clerk provides a summary of the Scottish Government's response on the issues of the establishment and work of a group to develop guidance and recommendations on surveillance, peer-reviewed evidence and National Services Division policy. The petitioner and Ian Galloway have responded to the Scottish Government submission and appear to feel that no significant progress has been made on this issue. Ian Galloway raises a number of questions that he feels remain unanswered by the Scottish Government and the petitioner has made a number of comments on the Detect Cancer Early Programme in the context of the petition. I certainly thought that both the petitioner and Ian Galloway really made very compelling arguments about um, more needing to be done, done to address the concerns that they were identifying. And one of the things it felt to me that is an, an ongoing frustration is because it, the incidence of this cancer is very low, it's as if it, doesn't, it isn't getting the attention and understanding that perhaps it merits. And you can understand uh, the frustrations of, of the petitioner, Andy and Galloway, that they see something very straightforward that would support sufferers of this cancer and early identification of um, problems in the liver, and, and I did personally thought that the Scottish Government's response, well, I would say defensive, I think I felt it was, but I'd welcome comments of, um, of other members about how they think we might take this forward. Morris? Yeah, yes, um, this is an interesting one. Um, I, I think, and I've had a prior discussion with you on this, I would like to see the Scottish Government look at what happens in Liverpool, Sheffield and Southampton, who are all top dogs in this, um, because they certainly have got the formula right. I know this from an experienced friend of mine. So son has had this situation and has gone through the process, and, and uh, it is clear that Liverpool have the right pathway, shall we say, for this, uh, and so does Sheffield and uh, uh, Southampton. So I would ask the Scottish Government to look at what they're doing and can we pick up on the... the, the all the plus points on that, because it's clearly they're delivering it. It did strike me that the Scottish Government argument was, well, this has not been proved, there are issues that's not been peer reviewed and so on, but we know that practice in other parts of the United Kingdom yes. are different. So I would have seen the point if they'd said, our priorities are different, and so this is not, you know, but I thought they were questioning the evidence base for it, which would be questioning then the evidence base used in other parts of the United yes. Kingdom, which I was quite taken aback by. Rona? I, I agree with Morris, and I think Ian Galloway's quote, you know, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, is, is mm. quite apt, yeah, because, you know, it doesn't prove, it doesn't lead us anywhere, so um, I think, you know, more questions have to be asked about, is there a way forward, um, and why there, and we, you know, so that the petitioner's um, concerns are, are responded to, because um, it's, it's a very strong very strong petition, and I, and I think um, I think you know we we need to keep, we need to keep it open and take it forward. There is some more that issue that I flagged up already. That if something is rare, is it? You can understand why people, and I'm sure it, nobody's doing this intentionally. But if a cancer is rare, does it mean that it's not um, the the process is not the same as for the more common cancers? And that would be. You can understand why people would be gravely concerned about that. I certainly wouldn't think it was intentional, but maybe it's just simply there's a lack of understanding and awareness of it in the same way. And how does the health service address that problem? I think it's quite an interesting one. And it must be quite frustrating to know that um, you can receive that MRI-style treatment south of the border and, and not in Scotland. And I think that's where, um, for me, this is a very strong petition um, because of that aspect of having choice and having to be forced down the, that route, route of travelling, and, and that is a, an, an anxious process um, for people who are already unwell. Well, I think the point, actually, in part of the petition was that people would rather travel if they're going to get the, the most appropriate, most effective treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the concern, certainly in the papers, that if you go to a local hospital, they may not catch it, they may not spot it because of their lack of expertise. And so at some point further along the line, things have progressed in a way that 
might not, I mean, that's just a horrible position to be in when you start thinking there might have been in, in, in these circumstances. I, I, I just, just feel we're not gripping the fact what's available elsewhere. That's really my concern. And that's the concern I've had from this experience. I've, if you, don't, you probably remember when we had that gentleman who came and had actually been through it. I remember talking to him afterwards, and he's absolutely reflecting what I've just said. I think it might, might be one, too, for the new Cabinet Secretary for Health yeah. to, to come in and, and um, you know, give evidence for it. OK, so we're agreeing, certainly, that we'd write to, in the first instance to the Scottish Government, asking them to respond to the questions posed by Ian Galloway and to respond to petitioners' comments in relation to the Debt Cancer Early Programme and this whole question about how they deal with rare cancers and to what extent they appreciate that sufferers of the same condition in other parts of the United Kingdom would, would have an expectation of a different uh, treatment. And I think, again, we may want to flag up this is something that in a later stage we want to hear directly from the Cabinet Secretary um, about. If that's the case, we can then move on to, and again, to thank the petitioner, Andy and Galloway, for, I think, very substantial uh, submissions that they provided, which were very helpful. But if we can then move on um, to our next petition, which is uh, petition 1664 on the greater protection for mountain hares. And can I welcome Mark Ruskell, MSP, um, for this session. At our last consideration of this petition may, we noted that the Scottish Government intended to explore the prevention of mass culls of mountain hares, including the legislation and a licensing scheme. This intention was set out by the First Minister in response to a question from Alison Johnson, MSP. As members will recall, this is in addition to the independent Grouse Moor Review Group set up by the Scottish Government to look at the environmental impact of Grouse Moor management practices and will include mountain hare culls, which is expected to report in spring 2019. The petitioner states that he is encouraged by the action taken by the Scottish Government to explore options to prevent the mass culls of mountain hares, but highlights that urgent, the urgent action is required to protect the mountain hare population in Scotland. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I don't know whether it would be useful, perhaps, Mark, if you want to say a few words. Yeah, thanks, convener. Just just had a couple of comments on this one. Um, I mean, there have been other petitions that are related to concerns around the management measures employed by driven grass moors, and one was the, the petition by Logan Steele <coughs> um, around concerns around raptor persecution, the need for a licensing regime, and the Environment, Climate Change, and Land Reform Committee, on receipt of that petition, has been doing, I think, some really good scrutiny on that as one aspect of the concerns that petitioners have. Um, about driv driven grass moor shooting and the, the, the Warity review that's now looking at licensing, I think, has come out of some of the, uh, the committee's scrutiny work on that and discussions with the Cabinet Secretary. Um, so it would seem to be, in my mind, logical for this petition to be forwarded on to Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform on the same basis and that it looks at a particular management measure um, which is being used by driven grass moor shooting, which is controversial driven grass more estates, which is controversial and which there's a lot of debate around. So it, it would seem sensible within the context of that wider discussion for that committee to be to be feeding that in. Um, I, I mean, uh, the, the petition also talks about the, um, you know, the, the open season on the 1st of August and the kind of more immediate issues about what happens this year while this review is undergoing and there perhaps isn't the kind of constraint on uh, culling of mountain hares that the petitioner would like to see. And um, again, I think that, that's something which the Environment, Climate Change, Land Reform Committee might, might be able to uh, consider as part of our wider evidence around biodiversity and scrutiny of SNH. So that was, that was my, okay. my thoughts. I'm also aware that you know, one of my colleagues from ECCLR, Angus MacDonald, also sits on this committee as well and may have his own thoughts on it. Okay, Angus. <clears throat> yes, thanks, um, Camille. Yeah, I would, I would concur with uh, uh, Mark Ruskell. I think there's a, a strong argument to refer the petition to the Clare Committee uh, now, given that uh, this committee would still be waiting on um, the Scottish Government's reassessment of the, the, the data on, on large-scale mountain hare culling, um, which isn't available yet. So um, while that information is coming through, then it does make sense to, to just refer it to clear uh, at the moment to tie in with the other work that the committee is doing on this. Okay, and we would be expecting 
that committee to perhaps be responding once the Scottish Government's reassessment of the data um, on large-scale mountain hair culling is available. So in referring it, we would be highlighting this was something that we thought was an important aspect of it. Um, the petitioner wouldn't have taken this straight to... Why did they bring it to petitions and not wait for the review if they thought that we were going to refer it straight to a Clare? Well, first of all, they wouldn't have known what we were going to do with it. And it, I think that issue around that is one element of, of the petition. So, you know, if we were going to hold on to the petition, that is what we would be looking at. But I think that, I, mean, I certainly feel the argument has been made quite strongly that to put it in the context of the broader issues of the subject committee makes sense. Because it may be that once we got that information, again, we would simply be referring it on. So, um, I wonder if. Um, we are agreeing then that we would be referring this petition to the committee with a long title that I can never remember. You tell us what it is, Angus. Uh, Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Okay. Is that agreed? Yeah. Okay. In that case, we're agreeing to pass it on as described to the relevant committee. Um, in that case, we can then move on to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1683 by Jennifer Edmonston on support for families with multiple births. At our first consideration of this petition, we agreed to write to a range of stakeholders. The paper summarises the responses received to date. The Scottish Government sets out a range of policies and initiatives that it is taking forward. These appear to be broadly welcomed by the petitioner and other stakeholders, including TAMBA, the Multiple Bust Foundation and Homestart. They do, however, seek some clarity in some areas, particularly in relation to childcare and peer support, and consider that there is room for improvement in the level of emotional support and understanding amongst healthcare professionals. And wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Rachel? Um, I, I noted in the evidence that uh, Obviously, the Scottish Government have the power to top up child benefit, but um, the evidence suggests that um, the Irish model um, of child benefit for twins, triplets and higher order multiples um, seems um, a, a model that is suggested that is, is more fairer um, to those who have multiple births. And I, I wondered that um, if we did write to um, Marie Todd whether... Uh, that would be considered within um, her response? Well, there's an argument that that element of it would actually be around the Social Security Minister, who's now... I've um, forgotten her name. Um, Shirley. Shirley Ann Shirley. Somerville. Um, I think there is a question around that, which I would be interested in exploring, but I was also very struck, first of all, by the quality of the evidence and the substantial evidence from Homestart, Tamba, and indeed the petitioner, which mm -hmm. is... Not the, the financial issue is one, but actually the kind of supports that are around them, the thing that the fact that you haven't planned to have two children, you have two children, the impact on your working life is um, the, way in, you know, the way in which you were going to be able to support your family by both of you being out working, the, the effect of that, but the emotional impact and support that people get. So I suppose I'd be quite interested in how the Scottish Government sees their role in supporting some of these third sector organisations. You know, because they're delivering, they're having folk refer to them, but they're not necessarily having resources um, directed to them, allow them to do their job really well. I'm sure all of us will know about um, Homestat within our own local areas, but I know that they do some fantastic work when um, families feel really um, under pressure. So I would be quite interested in, yes, the benefit side of it and child benefit and what the Scottish Government is looking at around that, but also how do they look at this the emotional and um, personal support sometimes that families might require. Rona? I think we should write to the Minister for Child Care in early years and put these these points to her and um, and take it on from there mm -hmm. and just, you know, keep it going. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And separately write to Shirley Ann Somerville regarding the um, uh, funding um, aspects. Yeah. And I think on the, on, the, on the baby box point, which I thought was really interesting, um, you know, people will have their own views about the, the baby box, but the idea that the second child gets um, that the non-reusable stuff would be taken from, I thought was quite an interesting argument. I think, you know, in terms of 
I don't know whether the Scottish Government is reviewing, I'm sure there will be at some point in the baby box system, but looking at that, have they looked, thought through what it means if you've got more than one yeah. child uh, at time, or is there something around, once you've got the, the, the stuff that's reusable, uh, does they, are they going to amend the provision of the baby box? I, mean, I just thought that was quite an interesting, quirky idea, and it might be something the Scottish Government might want to look at. So. Yeah. Sorry, Angus. Well, I was just going to say, given we've got the circular economy bill coming up uh, at some point in the future, it's well worth looking at, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, again, I think we would want to recognise the quite substantial issues here, you know, kind of issues that people probably haven't thought about unless they're caught up in it themselves, and we very much appreciate the petitioner's response and indeed all those who have given us such thoughtful evidence and we would want to write in the first instance to the Minister for Childcare in early years around this specific issue around personal emotional support, but perhaps get an update from the new um, Cabinet Secretary for Social Security around what they're looking at in terms of um, support for families as well, if that's agreed. He was a father of twins my first time around. I said it was a shock, but uh, I can understand the issues. We had to make some decisions and, uh, and who, who was going to go out to work, basically. Mm. Yeah, and I can understand a lot of empathy with this. Okay, thanks very much for that. In that case, if we can move on to the final petition for consideration today, which is Petition 1680 by Angela Flanagan on private water supplies in Scotland. As members will recall, at a previous consideration of this petition in March, we agreed to seek the Scottish Government's views in relation to the action called for in the petition. The Scottish Government's written submission explains that the Private Water Supply Scotland Regulations 2006 were reviewed and updated as recently as last year. The submission also states that regulatory powers over the drinking water quality of private water supplies should remain with local authorities and that it does not support the petitioner's call for an equal right of appeal in the planning process. In her written submission, the petitioner expresses her dissatisfaction with the Scottish Government's position in relation to the action called for in her petition. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I, I think Morris? We should uh, close the petition because I was actually in Ayrshire the other day with the NFU and, and we had representation from one of the Ayrshire councils, the actual water expert, and it was clear that the councils have got a really good grip on this and are now implementing it. And certainly it's causing some concerns with farmers, for example, on their own springs and things like that. But, the general feeling was that um, there was a clear direction of travel uh, with the authorities, local authorities, implementing it. Um, so clearly, it's obviously got some traction. Rona, I think I think the fact that the regulations were um, reviewed and, and new ones were set last year, and the government have made it quite clear that that that's they're not going to to go uh, beyond that. I don't. I think we should close the petition at this point. Yeah, Angus? Yeah, and also, convener, I think it's clear to see that the government are digging their heels in when it comes to, uh, w well, with regard to third party right of appeal. Um, th there doesn't seem to be any appetite at all from the government on introducing that into the planning bill, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, but uh, clearly, that, that was one aspect of the, the petition that um, isn't likely to move forward. Well, certainly, the, the thing around. I think they're calling it community right of appeal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they have no doubt whatsoever that that will be debated in, in the planning process and maybe the petition will be able to, um, to to influence that. I think the Scottish Government's position is clear, but how the parliamentary arithmetic mm. works out. But that would be where that matter would be resolved. It felt to me that the idea that you would centralise, I could see the argument in one way, but centralise um, the regulation of private water supplies probably means that people would be less aware of the very localised nature of some of the issues and, yes. and very different in different parts of, of, of Scotland and whether it is about monitoring closely what local authorities do and how, how close they are in terms of understanding some of the challenges that have been identified by the petitioner is one thing but I don't think that the solution, didn't feel to me that the solution um, was to take that to, to the centre, I think that because you know, topography, geography of Scotland is so diverse in itself. I noted that the drinking water quality regulator for Scotland has been delivering training to local government um, environmental health officers to ensure that they are up to date on rules and regulations. Um, I, I think that's the key point here is that 
all local authorities are up to date with their training and they know what they're doing and they've got a good handle uh, on the situation. Because I, as you say, if it was changed, perhaps they wouldn't have a handle on the local issues yeah. that were happening. I think that was demonstrated. Well, I saw it actually demonstrated in the Ayrshire Hills. Um, on in particular, we were actually standing at a spring and he was explaining what happens. And I was very impressed with the head of or head of the water engineering of the local council was absolutely on the ball and they've done this for years. So, Yeah, there are going to be local issues. I mean, you know, you, you can't... One of the problems that came up was the question of a farmer, you know, fertilising the field and, 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 and where was the water catchment area? You know, and it might change from year to year. So that's local knowledge. that You cannot put one size fits all. So I think strengthen what we have. Okay, I do you think there might be an issue about the capacity of local authorities to continue... Um, or maybe that they need to underline to local authorities that this is this is like a really important issue. So when they're managing their budgets, and we do know there's massive pressures on them, that this actually matters in terms of local communities and their and their health. Angus, um, no, it's just a, a clarification, convener, um, for the benefit of the official report. Uh, um, I, sh I should have been referring to uh, the equal right of appeal rather than the third party right of appeal. Yeah. By any other back, name, possibly. Back too many years. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember it well. Um, <laughs> as a planning minister at the time, I recall it very well. Um, so I think we're agreeing um, that we are going to close the petition understanding order uh, rule 15.7 on the basis that there is no support from the Scottish Government for the action being called for in the petition. But I think probably on balance we feel that the, the importance of regulation and, and protection of people's um, water is best done at a, at a local level. Um, so if that's agreed, we would agree to close that petition, but to thank the petitioner very much again for engaging with the petitions committee and highlighting issues of concern um, to her, their own community. Um, I think with that, we've nearly reached the end. Can I just wish everybody a a very good recess and thank them all. Thank you all very much for your support uh, in the last year in the work of the Public Petition Committee. I think we can be proud of a lot of what we've achieved, if, not, if, if, for not, if nothing else, allowing people across our communities to raise issues that we may not have thought of otherwise, but actually have been really, really matter to people. So we want to thank all those who have engaged with the petition process, thank our clerks and thank members, and wish you a, an enjoyable recess. Thank you. Close the meeting with that. Yeah.